this is it. This is where I suppose we And as a black... Why we as Americans have to reconnect with our roots. The depth of suffering and the height of joy that these songs can articulate. One way that we can explain the mother of God is in song. My mother. So how did we get where we are today? A discernible shift in the place Fighting of Africa. what is most important in our lives. Light in my darkness. The Holy Spirit is able to. So if you want to participate in the movement, you've got to prepare yourself. The title this evening, touching on the theme of the conference, is finding an anchor in a post-Christian culture. I believe that and hope and pray that this presentation relates to the theme of having Christ as our anchor of hope since our society, in general, has lost all mooring and reference to the Christian faith. That's hard for us to admit, but I believe it's true. So we look at a general overview of the landscape of American culture today, and we see that we're living in what might be described as a nihilistic, cultureless culture. And it sort of begs the question, how did we come to that? I would like to reflect for just a minute as a baby boomer, and I think that I can do that since I am a baby boomer, say these things. We're starting to age and we're starting to retire, baby boomer generation. As a generation of Americans, we deliberately set out to destroy all the American establishments and institutions in this country. We set out to destroy it. I'm not saying that every individual baby boomer did that. I'm not saying that every individual baby boomer participated in that. But as a generational phenomenon, that was the charge. Looking back on it 50 years, I would have to say we succeeded. We destroyed it. I've had many conversations with my two brothers, Paul and Owen, my older brother, kind of lamenting the fact that the country that we grew up in, 50s and 60s in Oklahoma, that country no longer exists. And they say, I, I absolutely agree with you. And so what do we do? What do we do with that? You know, when we think about America and American culture, because depending on which generation you're talking to, you might get a completely different answer, a completely different perspective on what does it mean to be an American? Because when I think about being American, I think about growing up in the 50s and 60s, and that world's not, it, it, does, it doesn't exist anymore. So maybe I'm kind of living in a bubble. These younger generations, especially the young men, they feel, and I'm interviewing them. I mean, I don't mean formally, formally interviewing them. I'm just talking to them. They feel that there is no purpose no value, no meaning in life. 
they feel marginalized. They feel dismissed. They feel rejected. And they have been taught that males are a part of a patriarchal society that must be destroyed. Do you think I'm exaggerating? They need healing. They are coming from broken homes. Why are so many of them coming from broken homes? Well, there are an infinite number of ways. Let me again hearken back and blame myself. They're, they're, they're coming from a generation that foisted the free sex movement on our society that made no fault divorce just an easy thing to do. People brag about how quick you, quickly you can get a divorce these days. They brag about it. Rather than being saddened by it. They come from the homes we broke. They have been emasculated. You've heard the word emasculated. Their masculinity is being stripped from them. Where? In school, from their teachers, on TV, in the public society in general. Guess what? In our church, they can be a man. Does that make sense to you? In our church, they can come and they feel like I can be a man. And so we have a challenge today of presenting the gospel to a nation that has lost all reference to Christianity. Let me give you an, an example. And again, forgive me if it's just a baby boomer using baby boomer era references, but that's who I am. Anybody here ever watch a Billy Graham crusade on television? All right, or maybe even went, went to one. When Billy Graham said, the Bible says, and he would quote the verse, everybody believed it, whether they were following it or not, whether they were obeying it or not. No one really questioned that the scripture, the Holy Scriptures was an authoritative source of uh, and, and life directing force, not only for Christians, but in our society in general. Now, Who's going to get up and say, the Bible says? Because nobody, well, who cares what the Bible says? And I don't, I don't know what the Bible says, and I don't care, and I'm not going to study it, and I'm not going to read it. And so how do we come to a nation that has lost all reference to Christianity? It's still deep down. It's still deep down in memory. You know, we've, we, we've talked before about uh, trauma that passes from generation to generation. I think the memory of the Christian faith passes from generation to generation too. Does that give us hope? Does that give us an anchor of hope?
We want to find an anchor of hope. And I believe that especially these young men and these young families with the young children that are flooding our churches right now, flooding into our churches. How do you explain this other than the Holy Spirit is leading you? It's not the latest missionary technique. There isn't one. They're finding us. They're coming. God is bringing them. So they're finding an anchor of hope in the sacramental life of the church. And we need to offer our cultureless culture the culture of the kingdom of God, not of this world, is an anchor of hope. I'm going to say it one more time. We need to offer our cultureless culture the culture of the kingdom of God, not of this world, as an anchor of hope. And so what does that look like? It looks slightly different in every culture. What if the culture in which we live has been destroyed? When we say American culture, what do we mean? What do we think of? How would we describe it? Perhaps in a radically different way from a 20 year old. You know, there's this phenomenon going on and I think the school's out right now on whether it's good, bad, or in between. Have you heard the term ortho bros? The ortho bros? <laughs> well, I think in as much, this is these young 20s. I, I think in as much as their ortho bro life is lived on the internet, there needs to be a great deal of caution. If we can bring these ortho bros into the life of the church, then they will truly find what they're looking for and a healing of the heart and mind and the will. Otherwise, if it's just conducted on the internet, they're all in their head. So we need to pray for them. I think men like uh, Jordan Peterson, Jonathan Pajot, do you know who these men are? I think their influence is bringing a lot of these young men. Hank Hanegraaff, believe it or not, those of you who know who he is, a Bible answer man, brought a lot of people towards the Orthodox Church. They're interested in church history. They're interested in patristic literature. They're reading like fiends. And this began during COVID when they were isolated, but it hasn't stopped since COVID lifted. Here's a quote from one of them. I do sense an appeal to the uncompromisingly traditionalist aspect of the Orthodox Church for those particularly fed up with modernity it can serve as a beacon of hope or something to cling on to when they feel like that everything else is a sinking ship. I want those people in, in, in the church. We need to pray for them and look for every way and every opportunity that we can bring them in. We have a new mission church uh, in Bismarck, North Dakota. Please pray for the success of that new mission, St. Basil the Great. There was a young man there eating dinner with us on, on Sunday night after services. I asked him what was motivating him. He said, I want to see and understand what a family is. I just about fell out of my chair. I want to see and understand what a family is. This is how far we have fallen. So what do we do? I would like to read to you, and this is kind of long, 
I'll try to read in a lively fashion to keep you awake. This is a transcribed excerpt, and I transcribed it myself <laughs> because I've listened to it about 50 times. It's a transcribed excerpt from Father Roman Braga speaking in 1995 at the St. Ignatius Antiochian Orthodox Church in Franklin, Tennessee. He says, in this 45-minute lecture, I'm going to read you about 10 minutes. Orthodoxy is to find Christ in ourselves. You became Orthodox. And he was speaking to one of these former evangelical Orthodox churches that had been in the church now for about eight years. You became Orthodox. You didn't find Orthodoxy individually. If you think you came just by yourself to orthodoxy, you're still Protestant. Orthodoxy is the experience of peoples in God, not of individuals. And you come in the Orthodox Church in America not to become Syrians, not to become Romanians, not to become Russians or Bulgarians. Be yourself, American. Otherwise, God doesn't accept your experience because you have a tradition. You have a background that is given by God. Then he says, God made me to be born in the Carpathian Mountains. I cannot be other. For me, Orthodoxy is the experience of the Romanian peoples in the church. We come into the church not as isolated individuals. We come with our families, with our nation, with our culture. Sanctify and transfigure your culture. There are many good things in this country. Be good patriots. Orthodoxy today, he says, is accused of being chauvinistic and Nazi and nationalistic. It's not true. But you cannot be orthodox without your history. If you study better St. Maximus the Confessor, and it's a very difficult Holy Father, <laughs> he thinks that we are in a structure like concentric circles. The first circle, the little one, is the individual, which is a person, not an individual. An individual is something isolated. A person is someone who lives in community. And the individual person is included in family. And the family is a church, and we save our soul in the church and in the family. And the family is included in your culture, in your cultural background, in your ethnicity, so to say, in your history. And that ethnicity is included in another circle that is the church, the universal church, and the last circle is the sphere of God. If it doesn't develop in this structure, we don't reach God because God doesn't need me to be an isolated person who is nobody. If I come to God, I come with my family, with my history, with my identity. God wants persons. Now, this is Father Roman Braga quoting St. Maximus the Confessor. He goes on. Christianity is a very personal religion. When Jesus Christ said, if you don't deny yourself, you are not worthy to follow me. If you want to follow me, deny yourself, because if you want to save your soul, 
you will lose it. But if you lose your soul for me in the gospel, you will save it. This is not a double standard here. Here, we are false personalities because we are not authentic personalities. To be an authentic personality, be yourself. You have an identity behind you. You have a culture behind you. You have a country. You have a place in which God wanted you to be born. And that nation or country in which you were born has a history. You have to come into orthodoxy with the whole destiny of the American people because they have to find Christ and to be saved. Even if you are a minority, you can be just one person, but you come with the destiny of your people in the orthodoxy. That is orthodoxy. It's the experience of peoples in God, not of isolated individuals. Then he says, I don't know if you understand that. Be yourself. Then he starts pounding it again. Be yourself. Be an American Orthodox Church, not a Syrian Orthodox Church. It is natural that through you and not through me, the or in America will become an American Orthodox Church. We are born in our own countries and we have our own background, our own identity, but you have come with your own identity and with the destiny of this country because there's a goal which this country has to reach. If you read the prophet Daniel chapter 10, every nation has an angel The angel of the Egyptian people, says. The angel of the Hebrew people is Michael the Archangel, and so on. So who is the angel of the American people? Well, we have to think about that, he says. This nation, he says, is not just at random. It has a history. And never, never, never hate the religion that you came from. Always to thank God for my Baptist church, my evangelical church, that made me to understand orthodoxy and to come back to church. Thank God, because the basics were there. And the fact that you were sincere in that denomination in which you were before, that's very important because the Holy Spirit brought you home. Thank God for my Presbyterian church that made me to understand orthodoxy and pray for them. And you have to wish for them to find the church. No matter how many you are, maybe you will be in a minority you never are in a minority if you are with the truth. If you are with the truth, even if you are one person, you are a majority. So come with the whole American history and the perspective of the salvation of the American people here. And you pray for the salvation of the American people of which you are included. So we don't want you now to borrow things from Russia or from Romania or from Syria or from Greece. No, be yourself. God wants you to be yourself. When God said, if you save your soul, you will lose it. There are two kinds of personalities here. One is an authentic and one is a false personality. Our false identity, our false personality is that we don't want to be ourselves. 
we want to be something according to TV or imitating other things here. This world is a huge stage in which we perform. We don't live. We perform because we want to have a tie like that guy or look like that person on TV to watch them and see that haircut and so on. No. If you want to save this false personality, you will lose the other one. You will lose the true personality. You lose your soul. But if you sacrifice this to lose what is false in you for the gospel and Christ, you will save the true personality. So we have to be true, to be ourselves, to have our identity, to come to God, following that structure of person, family, ethnical group, church, God, these are the concentric spheres or circles. And if we don't want to develop in this structure, we are not ourselves. We are not even orthodox. End of excerpt. Is this too hard to hear? Do we know and can we reflect in our own hearts and minds right now how much pretense there is within the walls of the Orthodox Church in North America these days? And perhaps the last thing that we want to be or look like or act like is who we are. Americans. The culture of the kingdom of God, it seems to me, needs to establish these concentric circles in the hearts and minds of the people coming into the church with no reference point to any of these. They don't know what a person is. They're coming because we want to try to figure out what a family is. They don't know their history. They don't know what the church is. They don't know our national history. We need to think about this in terms of our inquirer class and, and the content of our catechism. So the person, what is a human person? You know, we have this distinction between the person and the nature and the energy. We get this from our theology of, of the Holy Trinity. That there is one simple, uncreated nature existing in three persons. That's the distinction of nature and person. And that these three persons of the Holy Trinity act in complete harmony and unity. That's the energy, the divine energy, the grace, the mercy, the love, the judgment. Teaching them that a human being is made in this image of the Holy Trinity. We can illustrate this very easily. Who am I? Think about this. Just think about yourself for a minute. Who am I? What am I? And what do I do? Do you know how many people equate, they answer, who am I? by what they do. Who are you? Well, I'm a social worker. Who are you? I'm a fireman. Who are you? I'm a stockbroker. No, who are you? You're you that God created. What 
What am I? I'm a human being, body and soul, in existing in my person. And then there's what I do. Just being able to draw those distinctions is going to help somebody clarify, oh, I'm a person. Because they don't even know if they're a person. They haven't even thought about it. Family. What is a human family? We read in Genesis chapter 1, male and female created he them. Is that something that we need to hear and repeat and review in our society today? Who would have ever thought? Male and female and male and female created he them. I'm no scientist, but would it be fair to say that we live in a binary universe? I mean, it governs just about everything, doesn't it? In his homily on the image and likeness of God, St. John of Damascus uses an illustration of Adam, Eve, and Seth as an image of the Holy Trinity. I think he used Seth because of what happened between Cain and Abel, and he didn't want to confuse the illustration. That's just my speculation. But he says this, we have an analogy in Adam who was not begotten, for God himself molded him. And Seth, who was begotten, for he is Adam's son. And Eve, who proceeded out of Adam's rib, for she was not begotten. These do not differ from each other in nature, for they are all human beings, but they do differ in mode of coming into existence. And he used this illustration, this human illustration, to help us understand, at least in a very small way, the theology or the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Well, what does this say? Does this not does this not say or imply that not only is the individual human being made in the image and likeness of God, but the human family is a reflection and manifestation of the image and likeness of God. We need to hear that to in order to have an anchor, an anchor that will give us hope that there's really such a thing as a human family and that it can be defined and that it is a manifestation of the Holy Trinity who made us in his image. Ethnical group. I believe the Orthodox Church in its diverse ethnic and national expressions finds itself in a unique position in our society to witness to the true equality of every human being regardless of race or ethnicity. But we have to want to do that. It's, it's right there, right in front of us to do it. But we have to want to do it. If we're willing, we can manifest this reality within the culture of the kingdom of God, not of this world, much better than a so-called utopian society which forces a false equality and egalitarian system on its citizens. Forced. We know that never works. Initiated from love, yes, that works. I had a conversation with Bishop Anthony, our, our Antiochian bishop in Toledo in the Midwest. And we were talking about our oratorical 
festival and one of the participants that, that spoke this line that equal is moving quickly towards the next step, identical. Think about that. This is truly a sobering thought. It's not enough now that everything and everybody be absolutely e equal and we're going to force that equality. But now we have to become identical. Well, how can we become all identical if, we're, if there's a distinction between male and female? How is it possible to become identical? Well, maybe with AI. There's a, there are Korean companies that are now using AI to create a perfect computer-generated Korean rock star. Got all the moves, all the mannerisms, clothes, height, weight, at everything, charisma, the whole, the whole nine yards. Identical to all the Korean rock stars that preceded. History. Now, this is a tough one for me. We look at national history, look at personal history, look at family history, look at state history. We can find good, bad, and ugly in all of it. So is my history good or bad? Is it mixed? Is it all good? Is it all bad? And we see these factions in our society, you know, that fight against each other on these things. What about my family history? I think this is more along the lines of what Father Roman was referring to when he talked about history, not to negate our national history. But what is my family history? And can I bring that to God? Whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's mixed. Is there any family in the room that doesn't have some skeletons in the closet that they don't want revealed? We're all broken to one degree or another, are we not? Well, in order not to be hypocritical here and ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do, let me just pull down the curtain on a few pieces, a few glimpses into my family history. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, some of it's mixed, and, and all of it made me. My grandfather, on my father's side during World War I, he was a corporal, and he was made a sergeant over a black infantry troop fighting overseas. Made a sergeant to oversee him. Commanding officer said, uh, Mr. O.J., you seem to get along with those folks pretty well. I'm putting you in charge, making you the sergeant. Well, why did he get along with those folks pretty good? Because he was born in East Texas, the northeast most county of East Texas, Cass County, on a farm with 11 brothers and sisters. He liked to play baseball. And the only organized baseball that he could find in that area was in uh, what was called the Negro Baseball Leagues. 
So he went and played baseball with them. And he got along with them. And you seem to do pretty good, Mr. O.J., so why don't you be in charge? During uh, my father and mother's 50th wedding anniversary, it was a small gathering. It was just us. Me, my two brothers, and our families. We were in my older brother's house. And my dad started telling stories, stories that had meaning, stories that were character building, stories to remind us who you are and what I want you to be, but in a very kind way. He had told this story, I had heard this story several times over the course of my life, but he told it again on that occasion, and that was a big occasion. And I knew in his polite and loving way that he was saying, you deal with this. Here's the story. My grandmother, McAllister, Oklahoma, back in the 40s and 50s, she had a maid. African-American, Minnie, Minnie was her name. And one day, my grandmother was laying into her pretty hard, and she seemed like she wasn't letting go of it. She was raising her voice at her, complaining of what she was doing in the house. And finally, Minnie rose up and looked at my grandmother and she said, Miss Finley, black folks got feelings too. Now why, why did he tell me and my brothers that story? Why did he repeat that story? Why did he say it on that occasion? because my grandmother was deeply impacted by that. Deeply impacted. And as I've thought on it, this is speculation on my part, why? Why was she deeply impacted by that? Because she came from a culture, not the immediate culture, but a generational kind of memory that if you would acknowledge that an African-American man or woman had feelings, you would be acknowledging their person. Make sense? And in that moment, my grandmother acknowledged the personhood of her maid. My father, during World War II, he was in the D-Day invasion of Normandy, Omaha Beach, June 6, 1944. He made it past the unbelievable scene there. But four days into it, June 10th, he was brought, he was ordered back. He was a second lieutenant. He was ordered back to the beaches saying, we're still having difficulty evacuating men and equipment off the beaches because of sniper fire. And you have to find these snipers and take them out. As he led, he jumped a fence and he, and he jumped on a landmine. These landmines were designed to pop up out of the ground and cut your whole bottom torso off. But because he had jumped on it, it didn't pop all the way up. It broke both of his legs, shrapnel up his arms. He's laying flat. Three black soldiers 
pain, put him on a stretcher to get him out. One of them stepped on a landmine. It killed all three of them and dropped my dad back to the ground. How he survived, God knows. A, a British officer took lamp mine, you know, mine detecting equipment, cleared a path and got him out and got him to a field army hospital. So I'd like to read an excerpt from my, uh, my father's eulogy that was given by my younger brother, Paul, when he died in 2003. The war had a very positive influence on my parents and made dad a staunch supporter of equality among races. He once told my brother, John, that's me. After the war, my dad said, we could not come back to an America as it had been. We had fought together with African Americans against the most racist, racist regime in history. And in seminary, when he and my mother earned master's degrees, my mom and dad chose to do all their field ministry, developing churches and programs among the National Baptist and the Missionary Baptist churches of the African American community there in Louisville, Kentucky. In McAllister, he conducted joint services, that's my hometown, Callister, Oklahoma. He conducted joint services between the East Star Baptist Church and African American Church and the Trinity Baptist Church, of which he was pastor. My brother Owen recalled how dad would take the children of his church over to the East Star Baptist to see what their children had made in vacation Bible school, and then their pastor would bring his vacation Bible school over to see what we had done. When Martin Luther King Jr. was shot, my dad stood hand in hand with the black community to memorialize his life. Dad did this with little or no support from the community and sometimes even with some silent criticism from those close to him. Now, I can remember when we went over there. I was 15 years old in 1968. And we sang Amazing Grace slower than I've ever seen it before. <laughs> but we sang it with the deepest heart and the deep, deepest sorrow. I think about this new liturgical music that Mother Catherine has produced and um, my heart is already in it and I haven't heard it in the divine liturgy. The church, we can present the church as more than a mere fellowship of the believers but as a one holy Catholic and apostolic church, explaining each of those descriptive adjectives and avoiding the terms only and true. Only true, we're the only true church. Could you stop saying that, please? Isn't one holy Catholic and apostolic good enough? It was good enough for the fathers of the council in Nicaea, and it's good enough for me. I don't need to add any adjectives. I believe this leads to a kind of hyper-fundamentalist view of ourselves, as well as an exclusionary view of other Christian groups or denominations as not being Christian at all and devoid of all grace and truth. 
The great fear of church leaders in the Orthodox Church today, are you ready? It's a great fear of Orthodox leaders in the church today is that they would be called humanist. An ecumenist. by their brother priests. Now, I don't want anybody to call me an ecumenist. I'm not an ecumenist, but I don't want to be afraid and motivated by fear either. This leads to a tighter and narrower view of the church by which Father Alexander described as a neurotic orthodoxy. Now, I want to read an excerpt here. Contrast to two sides. The first problem can be formulated very simply, although the solution is extremely difficult. How are we to combine these things? How can we live our orthodox faith, which claims the totality of our existence within a culture which which also claims to shape our existence. How can we live our orthodox faith, which claims the totality of our existence within a culture which also claims to shape our existence? This is the question. He says, this is the antinomy of our situation. This is where all of our difficulties are rooted. And unless we understand it, we will always have wrong solutions. These wrong solutions, quite popular today, follow two basic patterns. patterns. One, the pattern of neurotic orthodoxy. It is the attitude of those, whether they are native orthodox or converse, decide they cannot be orthodox unless they simply reject American culture who build their spiritual home in some romantic or idealized Byzantium or Russia, and who constantly curse America as decadent Western society, and to them Western and American are synonymous with evil and demonic, this extreme position gives us a semblance of security. Ultimately, however, it is self-destructive, and it certainly is not the attitude of St. John, who in the midst of a violent persecution said simply this, this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. Both of these verses from First John. In the attitude of some, however, orthodoxy is transformed into an apoc- apocalyptic fear, which has always led to sectarianism, hatred, and spiritual death. Now he describes the other side. The other dangerous pattern is that of an almost pathological Americanism. These are people who they hear in the church one word of Russian or Greek react as if it were a betrayal of Christ. It is the opposite neurosis. The neurosis of those who want orthodoxy to become immediately American. In the first neurosis, orthodoxy is reduced to a fanatical and negativistic sect. In the second one, American is falsified, for America is not at all a country which requires surrender, conformity, and the acceptance of the mainstream mentality as the American way of life. What makes this country great and indeed unique is precisely the openness of its culture to change. We have to cling to that as the truth because we're living in a storm right now. But we have to believe that we're capable of change 
and that we are capable of change for good. God, the final, to experience God, to have an experience in God. If you know Father Roman's story, you know, he was baptized as a child in Romania, grew up in the school system, went to university and seminary, was ordained a priest, became a monastic, and then came back and taught in the theological school as a professor, was thrown into the communist prison, and he said it was there that I had an experience in God. We need to seek this. You've heard evangelical preachers talk about, you know, uh, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, or have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Well, maybe we don't want to use that terminology. Could we use this terminology to have an experience in God? From Father Roman To experience God, to have an experience in God, He's saying it's an absolute necessity. In our daily routine of prayer, in the prayers of the church, in the sacraments of the church, in the continuing education provided by the church, can we get our catechetical programs on a more basic level? Now I'm talking more to the priest. Rather than the seminary level catechist, seminary level catechist. In my book, that's an oxymoron. Seminary level catechist, oxymoron. We need to make it simple. It can be simple. Convince me that the Christian faith is complex. If God is simple, then our worship of God and our life in Him is simple. Introduce primary source literature from the fathers of the church. There's so many books about what the fathers say out there. Why don't we introduce these people to the primary, to what they said? not what somebody said they said. You know that patristic series from St. Vladimir Seminary? That's awesome. St. Athanasius on the Incarnation. Chrysostom, you know, wealth and poverty, marriage and family. You know that series. They want to read, if they're readers, have them read that. In summary, you thought I'd never get there, did I? Person, true person, be yourself, family, my family, my family history, whatever it is, how much ever pain it causes me, whether I verbalize it or whether I don't verbalize it, I've got to bring that to God and ask him to save me and my family. Ethnical group. History. History of our nation. Many different interpretations out there of the history of our nation. What is your history? What is your interpretation of the history of our nation? And I ask you to do, do me a favor and do, do the whole world a favor. Give that to God in worship. Bring it with you to worship and offer it up. Offer it up to God. Offer our nation up to God. However you view it, however you interpret it. And ask him to save it 
transfigure it, sanctify it. Church, healthy church, open to visitors, walking that narrow way between the extremes of neurotic orthodoxy and pathological Americans, as Father Alexander put it. God, an experience in God, in the church, with our history, with our ethnicity, with our family dynamics as persons. Oh Lord Jesus Christ, our God, help us. Help us to do this. Help us to be completely open to you and everything, to be ourselves, that we may be sanctified and transfigured so that we may sanctify and transfigure all things through Christ in the kingdom of God, not of this world.